It says in part, the inspector general's letter cited a conversation between the president and Ukrainian President Zelensky as a potential violation of federal campaign finance law. Jeff Begays and other reporters were allowed to see the phone call transcript this morning. Jeff, this was a July 25th call. It was about 30 minutes in length. What did you see in that transcript? Yeah, we didn't get a lot of time with a transcript. We weren't allowed to take it outside of DOJ, but we took some of the inserts. We took notes. Uh, this was a five-page document. And, you know, as you might imagine, it starts out like any other call with a foreign leader would start. There's a congratulations on the election victory. Uh, but President Trump did allude to Europe not doing enough to help Ukraine. But then... He seems to veer into the DNC server. He mentioned CrowdStrike, which is a company that investigated the Russian hack of the DNC server. And then from there, he progresses to ask the uh, Ukrainian president about Joe Biden. And let me put this quote up on the screen for you to see. This is what the president said, according to the transcript, which according to senior DOJ officials is not verbatim, but this is what they have. Quote, the other thing, there's a lot of talk about Biden's son, that Biden stopped the prosecution. And a lot of people want to find out about that. So whatever you can do with the attorney general would be great. Biden went around bragging that he stopped the prosecution. So if you can look into it, it sounds horrible to me. And so that's one excerpt of something the president said to the president uh, Zelensky, the president of Ukraine. Now, whether that uh, is an example of a quid pro quo, that's obviously what Democrats are going to be looking into. But it is important to mention that DOJ, senior officials here say that their criminal division took a look at this. They don't believe there were any violations of the law. What is alleged here is that there was a violation of campaign finance laws. But according to CO, senior DOJ officials, they just don't see that in this document. But of course, members of Congress will eventually get this document and they will have to decide for themselves. And that's why this is important. Again, it was a five page document. We didn't have a lot of time to look at it, but we did get some quotes. Let me go through another one, because what we saw throughout the document is this mention of Rudy Giuliani, the president's personal attorney, as well as Attorney General William Barr. And that was surprising because we knew that uh, Rudy Giuliani would be mentioned in this document, but we did not not know that the attorney general would be mentioned. Here's one excerpt. I will have Mr. Giuliani give you a call, and I'm also going to have Attorney General Barr call, and we will get to the bottom of it. So this is what we have gathered from this document. We're still going through it. Uh, but so far, uh, it shows that there was this repeated mention of Rudy Giuliani and also Attorney General Barr. Back to you. All right, Jeff, thank you very much. Paula Reed covers the White House for us, and she joins us now. Paula, good morning. It's an extraordinary document. We're all sitting here digesting it kind of on the fly. Exactly. It's not a perfect transcript, apparently, more like notes. We should say at the outset that there is no evidence, nothing to substantiate the claims that President Trump made in that call to the Ukrainian president about Joe Biden and Joe Biden's son. That's right. It also appears from the notes that there is not what we would call an explicit quid pro quo, uh, quo if you do this, I'll do this exchange. Does it matter that it's not that explicit? It, it does matter legally. We know the president is very good about this. He's very good at putting pressure on people or getting his point across without saying something explicit that in court could be established as extortion or a bribe. We saw this repeatedly in the Russia investigation, the way he would dangle pardons without making an explicit promise. What's so significant to me here is we were looking for exactly how did the president pressure his Ukrainian counterpart in relation to the Biden investigation. And what we see here is he's suggesting that his personal attorney will reach out. He's suggesting the attorney general of the United States will reach out. And that's where things get a little tricky for President Trump. Because the question is, why would you entangle your attorney general? Why would you entangle yourself in something having to do with a political rival? That's significant. But again, he goes right up to the line. He doesn't make any explicit threat. We should point out here that the, the Justice Department says in a statement, the president has not spoken with the attorney general about having Ukraine investigate anything relating to former Vice President Biden or his son. 
Exactly. So according to this statement, it appears that the president never followed up on this with his attorney general. I want to draw some parallels, though, here with what the attorney general is doing on behalf of the president. We saw with the Mueller report, uh, William Barr came out, he gave a press conference, he released statements before we got to see the report. He helped the president in that he helped sort of put a positive spin on everything that was going to come out. And here we see him doing that again. He's clearing himself. He's trying to get the facts out. But the fact that we have a statement here right now at the same time we have the transcript, it does help the president because it's like, well, he said this to the Ukrainian leader, but now I can turn around and said, well, I never really talked about it to the attorney general, so clearly I wasn't serious. But there still is not an explicit quid pro quo here. So exactly. Gonna, is this a big bowl of nothing or is there really something here? What will be the process now to determine how significant this is? Well, legally, it's important to it's important to note that the Justice Department has looked at what happened in this phone call and they did not clear him on all violations of law, but they said we don't see a campaign finance violation here, right? So it seems going forward, this will be, like so many other things in the Trump administration, a political fight on Capitol Hill. And it'll be up to Democrats and Republicans to decide if they believe this rises to the level of conduct that, that should support articles of impeachment. It's an open question. It's murky. I agree with you completely. There's no quid pro quo. Uh, there's no explicit promise or threat here. That's great for the president's attorneys. That's what they'll argue. But I think a lot of folks, a lot of voters in the Midwest may ask, why would you, right. why, why on you earth this up? would you go to a foreign leader to talk yes. about your political rival? Haven't we been through this for two years? But it does seem, depending on your feelings about President Trump, will depend on how you feel about this statement. There exactly. Doesn't... It's a Rorschach test for how you feel about President Trump. Exactly, try. exactly right, Paula. Nancy Cordes is on Capitol Hill, where we first learned about this whistleblower complaint. Nancy, so what's the reaction there to this transcript? I know everything is still in flux. Well, I can tell you, Gail, that even before the transcript came out, Democrats were very skeptical that it was going to be complete, that it would be an exhaustive readout of exactly everything that went down on this call, the exact number of times that the president asked the president of Ukraine to look into the vice president. And so that's why the House Intelligence Chairman Adam Schiff told me this morning, even before the transcript was released, that he still wanted to talk to anyone else who was on that call to make sure that the readout reflects the entire conversation that the president had with Zelensky about Biden. But Democrats also argue, and remember that impeachment is a political process, it's not a legal process, Democrats argue that they already have enough evidence to establish that there was a likely quid pro quo here, even if the president wasn't explicit about that on that phone call. Because if you widen out and look at the timeline here, about a week before the president had that conversation with the new president of Ukraine, his first conversation ever with the new president, he suddenly, unexpectedly, withheld about $400 million in military aid to Ukraine. No one outside of his inner circle knew why he was doing it. Even the Senate Majority Leader, Republican Mitch McConnell, was kept in the dark about the reasoning. Then, a week later, while that money is withheld, the president has this conversation with the president of Ukraine, asking him to help him in uh, clearly political ways. And so Democrats say that that shows that the leader of Ukraine knew that his military aid was on the line if he didn't do what the president wanted him to do. Nancy, Congress has heard from the whistleblower's attorney, but are they going to hear from the whistleblower and are they going to get a copy of this report? They are deep in negotiations over that right now, Anthony. The House and Senate Intelligence Committees are hoping to interview this whistleblower as soon as tomorrow and Friday before Congress goes on a two-week recess. But they are in negotiations with the Director of National Intelligence. He withheld this whistleblower's complaint because there were concerns that the whistleblower was discussing privileged information. If he was willing to withhold the complaint, why would he then allow the whistleblower himself or herself to come to Capitol Hill and tell members of Congress everything. Those are the talks that are going on right now. All right, Nancy, thank you. CBS News legal analyst Jonathan Turley is with us from Washington. He's a constitutional law professor at George Washington University and has criticized the push towards impeachment. Jonathan, good morning. Good morning. Uh, Jonathan, you can, you can argue that what the president did is inappropriate. Is it impeachable? It could be.
You know, part of the problem with the past impeachment allegations is there were very strong defenses that could be raised. This one would be an impeachable offense if proven. Self-dealing is something that can constitute a form of public corruption, and abuse of office. And so this is the real McCoy. You just have to prove it. The problem is with this transcript is that there's plenty here that helps the president on his defense. Not only are they a quid short of a pro quo, there's no express <laughs> promise, but um, it also contains his initial discussion, that is President Trump's discussion, about why he he wants other countries, European countries, to also put money into the Ukraine. Trump is insisting that he withheld that $400 million to try to put pressure on the Europeans to pony up. So the transcript will help him there. Uh, but there's also st you know, material here that will concern Congress and is a legitimate subject of investigation. You know, there could be a quid pro quo. They just need someone that can connect those dots. And so it's not going to come from this whistleblower, I don't think. The whistleblower Whistleblower apparently heard this third hand. I don't, I'm not too sure how he's going to move the ball. It's more likely to come from someone in the inner circle, including someone like John Bolton, who might have been have access to statements that would support the theory. You know Attorney General Barr very well. What do you make of his involvement in this? His name is mentioned in the transcript. Oh, I, I, I'm not surprised at all uh, that it, there was no contact with, with Bill Barr. Uh, the chances that Bill Barr would get involved in something like this is roughly the same as the president winning the Nobel Prize. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, he, Barr apparently never was told about the call. He was informed uh, that his name came up once the referral was made. Uh, and so this is part and parcel of what we've seen before, where the president says things that, quite frankly, are reckless and disturbing, and what follows is crickets. No one does anything. Uh, and that seems to be the case here, but Congress has a right to find out if something more concrete was done. All right, Jonathan, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, once you. again, uh, the, with the remarks that the president made with the, uh, with the president of Ukraine have been released. Uh, we've got our first read of it, details still coming out, but there was, uh, the president did directly raise the question of investigating uh, uh, Vice President Biden with the president of Ukraine. Our coverage will continue on our 24-hour streaming network, CBSN. You can watch it at cbsnews.com or on our CBS News app. There will be more to come on your local news on this CBS station and tonight on the CBS Evening News. Many of you will return now to CBS This Morning. This has been a CBS News special report. I'm Anthony Mason with Gail King and Tony DeCopel, CBS News, New York. For news 24 hours a day, go to cbsnews.com. All right, welcome back, everyone. I'm Anne Marie Green. And I am Vladimir Dutit. We are following the breaking news this hour. President Trump has released what the White House is calling the full transcript of his July phone call with Ukraine's leader. This comes as House Democrats intensify their official impeachment inquiry against the president. So for more on this, we want to bring in CBS News intelligence and national security reporter Olivia Gazes. Alongside her is CBS News political correspondent Ed O'Keefe, a CBS News legal uh, analyst, Kim Willey. I'm not sure if we have everyone. Joins us now from the Washington Bureau. I think we're getting everyone we're bit by bit, right? So, we're right, but, get those but we got Olivia. Yeah, got but we got Olivia. Olivia. Here. And we have the transcript of this phone conversation. So we've been sort of feverishly going through it. Um, and it, you know, it does mention what the president says he brought up. Mm -hmm. He brought up um, uh, Joe Biden and Joe Biden's son and Joe Biden uh, shutting down a prosecutor um, that was looking into his son's activities. I actually don't see, Olivia, any mention of money. It's true. The, the quid pro quo, as we just heard, is, is absent from the transcript. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of things that the president, in his style, has brought up uh, in a way that you could see would raise eyebrows. He said, I counted, I think, four times that he said he wanted to put uh, the president of Ukraine, his people, directly in touch with the attorney general and with Rudy Giuliani, mm -hmm. the president's personal attorney, mm -hmm. which, you know, to discuss those, those uh, questions involving Biden. Uh, the president also mentions CrowdStrike, the cybersecurity firm uh, that first drew the link between the DNC hack and Russia, uh, kind of a nebulous uh, allusion to some of their involvement there. Yeah. Uh, he also mentions um, a former ambassador, Marie Yovanovitch, who was, who was removed from her post after sort of some concern, political concerns about her uh, were raised by conservative media outlets and Mr. Giuliani. So it is a, a 
uh, very Trumpian conversation in style in that it's, uh, you know, it, it, there's there's allusions to a lot of things without a direct ask. I mm -hmm. agree with you there. And then, uh, then let's bring in uh, Kim Whaley. She's our uh, legal analyst, uh, uh, law professor. Um, she's joining us now also from Washington, D.C. Uh, Kim, I'm guessing you've looked at this uh, transcript uh, and has it... Okay, stand by, uh, Kim. Let's go to the minority leader, Kevin McCarthy. Okay. But they'd be different this time. That they'd work to solve problems. At the same time, I watched Congressman Nadler run for a chairmanship of judiciary. He promised his conference that he would impeach the president. The Democrats lied to the American public, but Chairman Nadler kept his promise to the Democratic conference. Make no mistake, yesterday was a dark day for America. It was a dark day for the rule of law that the Speaker of the House would claim a president violated the law without ever having any information to judge it on. It was a dark day for national security. That you were willing to jeopardize the national security of our country today and in the future because of your own political bias. Name me one world leader, regardless of who sits in the Oval uh, Thank you let's very much. In, uh, from Kevin McCarthy making a speech there at the, on Capitol Hill to take you, you now to New York City, where the president I'm of the United States. I'm honored to be here today among so many terrific leaders dedicated to the future of democracy, prosperity, and freedom for the people of Venezuela. We are behind you. For this deeply important event, we are grateful to be joined by Secretary Mike Pompeo, Secretary Steve Mnuchin, Secretary Wilbur Ross and Administrator Mark Green. Thank you all for being here. Thank you very much. I want to extend my profound appreciation to every representative with us from across the Western Hemisphere. Each of you is part of a historic coalition of 55 countries that recognize the legitimate constitutional government of Venezuela. We are especially grateful to be joined by representatives of the people of Argentina, Brazil, Colombia, Chile, Ecuador, and Peru for their leadership and assistance in the face of an unprecedented political, economic, and humanitarian disaster, which has been going on for a long time, and we're helping a lot. We are helping a lot. Let me also recognize two leaders from the government of Venezuela's legitimate interim government, Presidential Commissioner for Foreign Affairs, Julio Borges. Where's Julio? Julio, please stand up, Julio. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Venezuela's Ambassador to the United States, Carlos Vecchio. Where's Carlos? Thank you, Carlos. Please. That's very nice. Thank you. Thank you very much. As everyone in this room knows, the situation in Venezuela is a tragedy of historic proportions. The Maduro regime does not care about the welfare of their own people. They care about their own power. That's what they want, is power and money. They want the money, too, not just power. Socialism has destroyed what was once among the most prosperous countries anywhere in the world. You go back. 20 years ago, and you look, one of the wealthiest countries in the world, relatively speaking, and now they don't have water, they don't have food, they don't have medicine, they don't have anything. Today, Venezuelans are starving, and they're dying from lack of medicine, doctors, help. According to UN Human Rights Commissioner Madero's Cuban-trained death squads have murdered up to 10,000 Venezuelans, and they think that number is extremely low. Citizens since uh, all since 2018. That's over a very short period of time. These atrocities are an outrage to all and everything that we hold dear. As President of the United States, I am committed to the future of stability, prosperity, and liberty for Venezuela. We will stand with the Venezuelan people every single day until they are finally freed from this horrible and brutal oppression. They will be freed. It will happen. Our first objective is to ensure a peaceful and constitutional transition, paving the way for free and fair elections. 
That's why we, at the United States and in the United States, are doing everything we can to isolate Maduro and his cronies. Over the past year, the U.S. Treasury Department has imposed very tough sanctions to prevent Maduro and his enablers from accessing the U.S. financial system. Last month, I issued an executive order to completely freeze the assets of the Maduro regime in the United States. Our sanctions have been tightly focused on closing down every avenue by which Maduro sustains his criminal and totalitarian rule. And he uh, has been vicious. He's been corrupt. He's been as bad as you get. At the same time, we have undertaken significant efforts to ensure that the Venezuelan people have access to food, medicine, and other humanitarian supplies, despite the regime's efforts to stop aid from coming into Venezuela. They are making it very, very hard to get aid into Venezuela. We are getting aid into Venezuela, but it's a very difficult thing. You would think, frankly, that would be to their benefit to let aid get in instead of letting people die from lack of medicine or food. But they don't make it easy, but we get it in anyway. We call on Maduro to immediately allow his life-saving humanitarian aid. This has to be allowed to come into Venezuela for the long-suffering Venezuelan people. Unfortunately, a few countries outside of this hemisphere continue to enable this depraved regime with military and technological support. The most significant factor propping up the Venezuelan regime is the communist dictatorship in Cuba. Maduro allows Cuba to plunder Venezuelan's oil, raid its wealth, and rob its people. Venezuela's oil is at a low point. Not much is being taken out. Not many people are in there because of the dangers involved. But nevertheless, there's some money coming out, and it goes into Cuba. He's allowed thousands of Cuban agents to infiltrate Venezuela's security forces and other institutions. In other words, Maduro has sold out his nation to a foreign dictatorship, and it has been that way a long time. The civilized world must pressure the Cuban regime to leave Venezuela immediately. The United States is ready to support a democratic transition government. And we know that our partners around the world... Of which All right, you're listening to the President of the United States uh, there uh, at the United Nations uh, making some comments there with some of the leaders uh, of Latin American countries. Uh, let's keep an eye on what the President is doing and saying. If he takes member, uh, questions from members of the press, we'll go back to it. But let's get to the breaking news right now. The uh, unclassified now report transcript of that uh, July 25th call with the President of the United States and the leader of Ukraine. CBS News Chief Justice and Homeland Security Correspondent Jeff Pegasus is outside Justice Department headquarters in Washington. He got a first-hand look at the five-page transcript uh, initially, even before it came out. Jeff, break it down for us. What do we know? Well, listen, we didn't uh, have a lot of time with the transcript. It was, what, a, a matter of minutes, really, to, to get a good look at it. We couldn't take it out of the Department of Justice. We quoted from it uh, in our previous reports. But, uh, you know, it starts out like any other call with a foreign leader would. There is this congratulations to President Zelensky of Ukraine. And then there is a progression from there. The president... Uh, lobs criticism at uh, the European Union leaders. Angela Merkel is mentioned. He says that yep. Germany isn't doing enough for Ukraine, uh, something that he alluded to in his remarks yesterday at the UN. Uh, but then from there, and keep in mind, this is a July 25th call. It comes a day after Mueller testified. Uh, the special counsel, Robert Mueller, testified before Congress. Uh, essentially wrapping up the Russia investigation, and the president was critical in the call with Zelensky of Robert Mueller. And from there, there is this mention of Joe Biden and his son and what the president believes is a need to investigate. And so it goes on from there. There are repeated mentions of Rudy Giuliani, the president's personal attorney, and 
And this is something that really came as a surprise to us was this mention of Attorney General William Barr. We knew that Giuliani would be mentioned in his transcript going into it, but we did not know that the Attorney General was mentioned as well. And in really the same vein, the president was encouraging Zelensky to reach out or to get in contact with both Giuliani and the attorney general. So there are a lot of interesting tidbits in there. Whether there was a, a quid pro quo, that depends on you know who you believe, who's looking at it. The Democrats obviously want to look at this transcript. They have their own opinions. But of course, senior DOJ officials tell us that they don't believe there was any violation of any laws here. There was this allegation, uh, in their words, of potential violation of campaign finance laws. They just don't see it in this transcript or in these allegations. All right, and in fact, we've got a statement from at least a senior DOJ official that says that the AG was not asked by the president to speak with Ukraine, which is the suggestion that he makes over and over again uh, throughout this conversation. Uh, Jeff, I want to thank you. We might be coming back to you, but for now, I want to bring in um, Ed O'Keefe, CBS News political correspondent, and of course, Olivia, you are with us. So listen, Ed, the thing that keeps jumping out at me about this is, yes, you know, much of what the president already sort of agreed to is in here. Right. He does talk about corruption and his concern about corruption. He does talk about the fact that he's concerned that uh, European nations are not doing their fair share. What I can't understand is why Rudy Giuliani is involved in any of this at all. He's supposed to be the, pre the not the president, Donald Trump's private right. attorney. Why Very important distinction. is he what would he be doing that would be the people's work if his primary function is to serve as Donald Trump's attorney? Well, Nothing. Right. I mean, what he was doing was Donald Trump person, his bidding, mm -hmm. um, and, and was essentially deployed to Ukraine and to Europe, we know this already, to, to try to dig up this stuff on the Bidens. Mm -hmm. and, and so the fact now, now you almost have two things. You have a conversation that the president had with another world leader about a political rival. And you have the mere fact that the president's personal attorney, not White House counsel, but personal attorney, was over there doing this work yeah. and apparently engaging government officials at the same time who may or may not have been uh, going along with this. Right. Uh, some have raised objections, we know. Others may have been willing participants. There's been reporting on this. Uh, so that adds another layer to this, as if we need another one. Uh, but, you know, it's a reminder that Giuliani has been uh, deeply involved in a lot of what the president has been up to yeah. over the past two years um, and clearly was deployed uh, to try to dig up dirt on potential opponents. And I think when you hear from the DOJ that the attorney general was not asked according to the DOJ to get involved in any of this. That's what they're saying so far this that's morning. That's what they're saying so far this morning. So at least the snapshot that we have now is it's really just Rudy Giuliani who's going over to the Ukraine. But though it seems odd, is it illegal? Well, that's why we have uh, Kim Whaley, uh, who's joining us from our uh, D.C. Bureau to talk uh, about all of this. Um, it's interesting to me, Kim, that you're hearing now, uh, as, as we pointed out earlier, that a lot of these documents, at least until we get the full whistleblower complaint, were going to be seen through the eyes of the beholder, that it was sort of a Rorschach uh, test, as you pointed out, Anne-Marie, earlier. Um, I want to read from the uh, transcript, uh, the one note that jumped out at me, of what the president said to President Zelensky. He says, quote, the other thing, there's a lot of talk about Biden's son, that Biden stopped the prosecution, and a lot of people want to find out about that. So whatever you can do with the attorney general would be great. Biden went around bragging that he stopped the prosecution. So if you can look into it, it sounds horrible to me. Uh, my question is, given the, the, the whiff of impeachment, the threat of impeachment that brought down the Nixon presidency, um, the bar here seems to be, look, the president didn't explicitly ask uh, Zelensky in this transcript to uh, do something to help him get reelected. But just the idea to me, I'm, I'm curious from a legal standpoint, that a president of the United States would ask a foreign head of state to look into the allegations of his main political rival, the one that in all the polls up until this point showed beating President Trump in 2020, is that not something? 
Yeah, I mean, this is actually, in in a way, easier for the American public to understand because we are not into legal standards and technicalities like we would be in a criminal courtroom. The impeachment process is a political judgment. The law is not limiting there. There, you do not need to prove a crime beyond, beyond a reasonable doubt. And the question here isn't really whether there was a quid, a quid pro quo, that would make it worse. But as you point out, the issue is whether we're comfortable as a society having a president or the office of the president be able to use the power in, and influence of the office, even if there's not a direct quid pro quo, it's a very important position on the planet, right, to basically get a foreign power to maybe dig up, whether it's accurate or not, information on political rivals and their children. That is, I think, as a matter of logic, something that is deeply, deeply troubling that because the, the idea is the next day it could be you or me. If the presidency has that kind of power to basically use the office to in, enhance and entrench his own power potentially, even if it doesn't violate a law, that is really concerning for the overall structure of the separation of powers, which is, I think, why um, we're even hearing some Republicans not necessarily rush to Trump's defense here. We're hearing Democrats say, you know what, if I don't make it the next Sorry. round, if I'm voted out, that's okay, because I'm here for the institution, not for myself. And I think that's the right lens for all of us in this moment. Um, I want to keep talking to you about that, because what I like about you, Kim, is that you sort of like elev elevate us to our sort of higher ideals about what this is all about. But I also want to bring in um, Nancy Cordes, uh, chief uh, congressional correspondent. Nancy, the Democrats wasted pretty much no time issuing a statement. Um, what's their take on this? Well, their take is that, first of all, they have uh, serious questions about whether this transcript is complete. Uh, they say what they've seen so far is damning enough, but uh, they want to be reassured that there wasn't more that was discussed here that was left out of the transcript. And so the House Intelligence Chairman, Adam Schiff, for example, told me this morning he wants to speak to officials who were on that call and get assurances from them that the readout reflects the entire conversation. But beyond that, uh, Democrats argue that what they've seen is enough to convince many of them that the president has, com co has um, committed an impeachable offense. They say, first of all, he asked a foreign power to manufacture evidence against his political opponent. And at the same time, he withheld aid to Ukraine that Congress had appropriated. They say there doesn't have to be an explicit quid pro quo in that conversation to make what the president did wrong. In fact, they argue even if he hadn't withheld the military aid at all, even if that wasn't hanging over the president of Ukraine during that conversation, they say that it was still well uh, outside of the, the bounds of the presidency for Mr. Trump to ask a foreign power to assist him in the U.S. election. And so uh, Democrats say that um, what they had known even before they saw this transcript was serious. They think it's even more serious now. And Speaker Pelosi has said more than once, Anne-Marie and Vlad, that she wants the party and the House more broadly to work very expeditiously. Democrats don't necessarily want this dragging on for a year. In fact, some of them have told me they think that uh, the House could produce articles of impeachment within the month if, um, if, if minds are focused on this. Hmm. Uh, okay, uh, Nancy, Kim, stand by. I want to come back to our uh, our guests here at the day, at the table with us. Uh, Olivia, first to you. Uh, I just want to point out to our audience here that in this uh, five-page document that we received from the White House, which uh, is the transcript of the tele telephone conversation with President Zelensky of Ukraine, at the very bottom it says a memorandum of telephone conversation is not a verbatim transcript of a discussion. I don't know if that means anything, but uh, Hogan Gidley was on Fox News. He's the president's, uh, one of the president's uh, assistant press secretaries. He said they would be releasing a verbatim document. Should that call into question anything we're reading here? I don't know that it would call it into question other than the fact that this may be an incomplete picture of what other people, of what everybody wants to ultimately understand about this call. But remember that the complaint itself we know to involve something beyond just this one transcript. Correct. Um, I'm actually also looking over the OLC, the Office of Legal Counsel opinion that the Department of Justice released alongside all of this transcript. And it, and it gives us some insight into the complaint itself. 
Uh, it, dis it says that the, de the complainant is describing a hearsay report. In other words, this is a secondhand information. Um, citing White House officials who had raised concerns about the nature of these communications. Um, it's saying that the ICIG, the Inspector General, um, ha had deemed it to be credible after finding some indicia of arguable political bias, something no doubt the President and some of his allies are going to pick up on. The um, whistleblower. In other words, they correct. found that the whistleblower may have a slight political bias, but... No, no, no. This, well, this is something that the ICIG had noted in his report, right? right? And, and, and this is what the DNI had consulted with the DOJ about. About. Right. And this is what DOJ has sort of listed out in this opinion, right. uh, in which it determined that this doesn't fall in the DI DNI's lane because it doesn't have to do with a member of the intelligence community or an ongoing intelligence activity. It has to do with confidential uh, diplomatic conversation that the, that the president had. But I think that these are interesting things about the complaint itself, which Democrats are still pushing to have uh, made available to Congress uh, that we still want to find out more about. So just to clarify, it was somebody who was secondhand, meaning they weren't on the call. The whistleblower. The whistleblower was not on the call, but they were told about it secondhand or heard about it from, from White House White officials. House officials right? is what this it is, says. This is what it says. The, the complainant alleged that he or she had heard reports from, quote, White House officials that in the course of a routine diplomatic communication between the president and a foreign leader, the president had made statements that the complainant viewed as seeking to pressure that leader to take an official action to help the president's 2020 re-election campaign. And then the watchdog figured out that this, that this whistleblower, using all the right words here, had a potential political bias? It says it's, it's preliminary, preliminary review found some indicia of an arguable political bias. So let's not overstate that. Okay. Uh, but the ICIG nevertheless concluded that the complaint's allegations nonetheless appeared credible. Okay. So, so. so, Ed, the question becomes now for members of Congress, and, and you know, as you know, Mitt Romney yesterday uh, said that perhaps the Democrats may have gotten ahead of their skis. Uh, there's going to be some who are going to suggest that, that, look, they hadn't even seen this, right. and because of... You know what the president's supporters have said, look, uh, they've been after this president since uh, the election, um, that maybe Mitt Romney was on to something. But as you hear from your interview with Adam Schiff, they don't think so. They don't, uh, because they've, they just the fact that the president said what he said, admitting to this, they believe now is an impeachable enough offense mm -hmm. or worthy of impeachment. Um, but now reading the details, you know, this does suggest that this wasn't you know, a principal, uh, wasn't a top senior aide to the president. It may have been somebody who heard it secondhand. The uh, inference here that this might be somebody with a political bias, I'd love to know more about that. Is that somebody who's... And the president who's has, been, he right. has been saying that all week long. That yeah. could mean that this is somebody who's worked in government since the Obama administration. It could be somebody who was a holdover from the administration. It could be somebody who maybe is known among members of the president's inner circle to be someone who's been critical of the president before. And to put that in there, uh, All true, but remember, this is coming from DOJ, which sided, I mean, the DNI sided with the DOJ in this sort of lawyerly dispute as to whether this was properly in the DNI's lane and whether this complaint actually needed to go to the uh, intelligence committees for oversight purposes. Yeah. So there's still the, the, the ICIG's uh, belief in all of this and the committee's belief in all of this, and we've got to wait until, uh, well, he's already testified before the House until he's going before Senate until tomorrow, and more importantly, I think uh, it now becomes absolutely uh, essential that the whistleblower, him or herself, uh, testifies before each of And they're working on that, right? Mm -hmm. House yeah. and Senate Intelligence Committee are working with that person's attorney and the DNI to figure out exactly mm -hmm. when and how that could happen. All right, so um, we still got Kim Whaley and Nancy Cordes uh, available to us standing by. Kim, uh, first to you. Um, I think it's interesting that uh, per senior DOJ official, uh, they say this, uh, the AG has not been asked to investigate Biden and the AG was not asked by the president to speak with Ukraine. Attorney General Barr did not know about the call until weeks later and never spoke to Giuliani about Ukraine. The question that I and Anne-Marie and I were looking through this transcript and we're like, why is Rudy Giuliani, the president's personal attorney, on these sort of missions to other countries uh, at the behest of the president? And why is the president saying that the AG and Rudy are going to be involved in this? And now the AG is saying, oh, I had nothing to do with anything. I didn't even know that the president had this call. The, per, Rudy Giuliani is the president's personal attorney, not the attorney for the presidency, but for Donald J. Trump. And I, and I think just to add to that, the the accusation is that, you know, the president was doing this deliberately to stymie his political opponent. And so here you have the president's personal attorney per, doing the uh, per, presumably his personal bidding, which would not be what's happening with his administration, but perhaps what's happening with his campaign. 
Yeah, so sort of back to basics. Um, foreign policy is important, and confidentiality in foreign policy is important. The president has to have communications that aren't made public and aren't handed off to Congress. Um, but that's not what happened here. And to your point, Rudy Giuliani is, is not in sort of on team American public. He is on team Trump. And so we don't, as I said before, um, for, for purposes of impeachment, we don't need a lot of additional information to know this is problematic for a president to do. Legally speaking, um, I mean, to the point on the, the, the DOJ's memo on the IG report, um, I also looked at that report. I, as a lawyer, also, I think their argument that this does not fall within the statute is quite slim or thin, in that um, the president of the United States is, is the head of the Department of Justice. He he is the head of the executive branch and all the intelligence agencies. To, so to suggest that the, the president of the United States conversations with foreign leaders somehow fall outside of the scope of intelligence is is a real stretch. Um, I haven't gotten through all of it, but I would just take that with a grain of salt in addition to this notion that somehow the whistleblower is biased. The issue is, what are the facts? We have a lot of facts that have come out, and we'll have to talk, hear from the whistleblower. We'll have to hear probably from Giuliani. Ideally, we'd also hear from the Attorney General of the United States. This is not a one-call story. This is not a five-page transcript story. It's a much bigger Kim, story with much broader implications. Kim Stanton. Yeah. By. Uh, we want to go to uh, the chairman of the Judiciary Committee on the Senate, Lindsey Graham. He's speaking. Let's listen. You should look at here. The Ukrainian president did not feel threatened. He was the target of the phone call. He felt fine with what happened. I've read it just like you have. You can make your own decision, but from a quid pro quo aspect of the phone call, there's nothing there suggesting that the prosecutor may have been fired because of a conflict of interest is something I hope somebody will look at over here, not the firing of the prosecutor. But Vice President Biden is a good man. I've enjoyed a good relationship with him. But I can assure you that if any Republican family member was engaged in conduct like this, they would raise questions. You can ask for the prosecutor to be fired if you think he's corrupt and it's in the national interest of the United States. A lot of people felt the guy was corrupt, but the one thing that I think is has to be dealt with here is that the son of the vice president was receiving a lot of money from the Ukraine, and some of the sources of the funds were under investigation by the prosecutor. I don't know what the right answer is. I just hope somebody will look at it, and I don't mind the president bring up the idea maybe the guy was fired because of a conflict of interest. But how was it, but how was it not inappropriate that the president asked the president of another country to look into a political rival who's running for election, possibly against him if he wins the primary uh, next year? I, I don't know what you looked at. I think it's very appropriate for the president of the United States to suggest that you got a corruption problem and this prosecutor that was fired, maybe it was because he was corrupt or maybe because he was looking, uh, looking at something close to America here. The vice president's son was receiving money from the Ukraine, was on a board of a company that was the subject of investigation. The question that got me going was, did the president of the United States suggest to the Ukraine, I will withhold money unless you go after my political rival? The answer is absolutely not. That's why I wanted the phone call to be released. I wanted Mueller to do his job, and he was able to do his job. The phone call is released. Now I want to know from the whistleblower, who told you about the phone call if you were not on it yourself? Who is it in the system that went to this person? Why did they pick this person to tell about a phone call? And why did the whistleblower file a complaint about something they had no direct knowledge of? Do you want the Senate General. Judiciary but, Committee to be involved at all in undercover uh, the, the Senate sent it all to the Intel Committee. Okay. So Democrats well, have um, yeah. asked you to bring in Attorney General Bill Barr to ask him about all of this yeah. and the whistleblower yeah. complaint mm -hmm. and the whole process behind the scenes. Will you invite him to I, talk about I, it? It's my understanding that the case has been referred to the Intel Committee, but I will look at what happened here. I mean, before I knew what was in the phone call, I said, it's a privilege matter, clearly. But the aura around the phone call was disturbing. Did the President of the United States take money that was going to the Ukraine and threaten to withhold it if he did not get help in his reelection? The answer is no. Did Joe Biden threaten to withhold money if he don't fire somebody in the Ukraine? Yes. Maybe there's a good reason to do that, but here's the, the elephant in the room. The person you asked to be fired was investigating companies that your son was part of. 
Now somebody needs to look at that. I don't care to look at it. Somebody outside of politics. From my point of view, Joe Biden's an honorable, decent guy, but there's an obvious conflict here. And it's okay to talk about an obvious conflict. But so many, but many Western allies and uh, people like International Monetary Fund also well, wanted a they, prosecutor did, did, removed. Yeah, did any of them have a family member working in the Ukraine? So it may be justified that this guy was corrupt. I don't know, but I do know this, that the person arguing for him to be fired had a conflict of interest. And if you don't see that conflict, you're blind. So, if you don't see that there's a double standard here when it comes to Trump and everybody else, you're blind. You're willfully blind. If this had been a Republican, you would be asking what relationship did your son's involvement in the Ukraine have to your decision to call for the guy to be fired? Did the New York Times tip off the vice president? There's an investigation that involves companies that your son may be part of. I'm not accusing them of anything, but there is plenty of conflict here that somebody should look at. The whistleblower's complaint, though, according to reporting, is not just about this one phone call. So when you say Get right it all now, out. Get it all out. What did you know? Tell us everything you want to know. Tell us, do you think something untoward is going on? Come forward if you want to. But right I, now, I that hear. whistleblower is being blocked I from want, our reporting from I am, coming up I here am, on the Hill. I am, do you think that DOJ I am offering the whistleblower person? a chance to come to my committee. If you want to tell the story about what bothers you, come to this committee, and I'll dare everybody in the Senate to stop me. Because I, I believe the phone call speaks for itself. The accusation leveled by certain people before they read the phone call has fallen flat on its face. They, they, they started impeachment based on a phone call they knew nothing about. Now the phone calls out. If this is going to result in impeachment of a president, God help future presidents, this is ridiculous. But as for the whistleblower, are there more, is, there, is there more there? Come forward. I am not afraid of hearing from you. You know, if President Trump did something wrong, let's find out about it. The phone call, to me, was nothing wrong. Do you think that the administration should let the whistleblower I, You know, I, I'm just making an offer. I don't think they can stop it. Right now they seem to be doing that. Yeah, I, Jay, Dan, I, no, I don't think they seem to be doing anything other than being transparent. I don't know what the law is. When we wrote the law about uh, intelligence whistleblowers, they never envisioned a conversation with the president. This is probably the most privileged thing any president could do, talk to a foreign leader. Now, going forward, foreign leaders are going to be reluctant to talk to our president if you wind up having it in the paper. But this was a unique moment, I thought. This was something that needed to be looked at, and it's being looked at. You've got the transcript of the phone call. You can read it for yourself. I've determined there's nothing there that this is not remotely an impeachable offense, I have determined there is a conflict with the vice president that somebody needs to look at. I'm not accusing him of doing anything. All right, we're going to take you to the floor of the Senate where uh, Senate Minority Leader Trump. Chuck Schumer is speaking. If each of us acted as a solemn juror of democracy who placed fidelity to the Constitution and our system of government above the narrow considerations of partisan politics. Now, on another issue, not directly related, but with the same cause, with the same worry, with the same concern, an overreaching executive, the emergency declaration. The commencing of the impeachment inquiry in the House, while significant, is not the only significant action Congress will take today, nor is it the only action dealing with the President's overreach. Today, the Senate will vote on President Trump's national emergency declaration which he is using to steal money from our military in order to fund a border wall. Rather than accept the reality that a bipartisan majority has repeatedly rejected this idea, and after dragging the country through the longest government shutdown in American history when he didn't get his way, President Trump deliberately circumvented Congress. Democrats universally oppose the President's outrageous decision to declare a national emergency. So let me direct my remarks this morning to my Republican colleagues. There are two crucial reason, reasons for my Republican colleagues to vote to terminate this emergency. First, the vote today is the surest and likely the only way to restore funding the President has stolen from our troops and military projects across the country. President Trump promised Mexico would pay for the wall. Not American taxpayers and certainly not the military, the men and women and their families 
involved in keeping our nation secure. President Trump broke that promise, and now... Stay with us, and like it's a political war, they shouldn't have done that. Uh, that should be an impeachable event, I guess, based on what you're saying. Uh, the Democrats just came out, they went down there, a group of people, some of whom I was dealing with on the gun issue, and they went down, put tremendous pressure on Ukraine. Uh, the president himself just came out with a statement saying there was absolutely no pressure put on him, and there wasn't. Uh, what I do want to see is I want to see other countries helping Ukraine also, not just us. Uh, as usual, the United States helps and nobody else is there. So I want to see other countries help. Uh, just so you understand, it's the single greatest witch hunt in American history, probably in history, but in American history, it's a disgraceful thing. Uh, the letter was a great letter meaning the letter revealing the call uh, that was done at the insistence of myself and other people that read it. It was a friendly letter. There was no pressure. The way you had that built up, that call, it was going to be the call from hell. It turned out to be a nothing call other than a lot of people said, I never knew you could be so nice. So uh, part of the problem you have is you have the fake news. You have a lot of corrupt reporting. You have some very fine reporters and journalists, but you have a lot of corrupt reporters, a lot of corrupt uh, journalists. I would rate you right in there, by the way. And, and excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. Uh, so we're having, if you notice, the stock market went up when they saw the nonsense. All of a sudden, the stock market went down very substantially yesterday when they saw a charge. After they read the charge, the stock market went up very substantially. Uh, we have created the greatest economy in the history of our country, the greatest economy in the world. Had my opponent won, China would right now be the number one economy by far. And right now, China is way behind us, and they'll never catch us if we have smart leadership, way behind. We've picked up trillions of dollars, and they've lost trillions of dollars. And they want to make a deal very badly. And it could happen. Could happen. It could happen. It could happen sooner than you think. Our military is rebuilt. Our military has never been stronger. When I came in, it was depleted. Our vets are happy. So many great things are happening. And the Democrats feel they're going to lose. We had the highest poll number, Rasmussen, 53. But they say you can add 10 to it. A lot of people say you can add more than 10 to it because a lot of people just don't want to talk about it, but they want to vote for Trump. So I just say this. Uh, we have the strongest country we've ever had. We have the best economy we've ever had. We have the best unemployment numbers we've ever had. We have the best employment numbers we've ever had. Uh, we have now almost 160 million people working. That's far more than we've ever had working in our country before. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Well, hearing All from right. the president and yeah. reinforcing what we heard from him before, um, the key for him is that the president of Ukraine did not feel any pressure at all. Right. So thus, I guess, suggesting that there was no quid pro quo. The president saying that, uh, as usual, he's the target of a witch hunt. Um, and you just heard uh, Senator Lindsey Graham speaking to reporters uh, before we went to the president, saying that, as far as he can tell, be based on his reading of this now transcript of this phone call between the president and the leader of Ukraine, that there is nothing that troubles him. Mm -hmm. Couple that with Chuck Schumer on the floor of the Senate saying there is a, an impeachable offense happening right. just based off of this transcript. So let's try to break it down. We've got uh, Kim Whaley in D.C. We've got Nancy Cordes on Capitol Hill. We've got Ed O'Keefe here along with Olivia Gazes. First to you, Nancy. Um, so you, you, we were talking about this earlier, that this transcript, at least in the early stages of this process, was going to be seen through the eyes of the beholder. In other words, uh, Republicans coming out and saying, look, they don't see anything that works worries them here, and Senate uh, uh, Democrats and, rep and, uh, cap and uh, rep representatives saying that this does constitute uh, an impeachable offense. Interestingly enough, Ed O'Keefe, who's here, just pointed out to me that Mitt Romney may have made a comment earlier uh, to some reporters that what he's reading uh, in this uh, transcript is troubling. 
Sure, and I think that there are more Republicans who find it troubling who uh, have chosen not to say anything for that very reason. Yes, you do have some very vigorous defenders of the president, like Lindsey Graham, who we heard from just a few minutes ago, who said that he saw nothing in this call uh, that was problematic because the president of Ukraine has said that he didn't have any concerns about it. Well, a couple things uh, in reference to that claim. First of all, um, this is a president, the president of Ukraine, who is highly dependent on the U.S. for political help and for financial help. So it is not in his interest to say that he felt pressured, badgered, bullied, what have you, by the president of the United States. Beyond that, we know that when he met with Senator Chris Murphy of Connecticut in Ukraine just a few weeks ago, he said something quite different in a private conversation. He told Murphy that actually he was very worried about the fact that this military aid, $400 million worth, was uh, mysteriously being held up, and that, that at the same time he was very concerned about the pressure that he was getting from the president and Rudy Giuliani about looking into Vice President Joe Biden and his son. So I think um, the question of w how pressured the uh, president of Ukraine felt and when is, is sort of still an open question. Um, and the reality is that, yes, this is going to be to some degree um, uh, uh, he said, she said, uh, uh, you know, it is going to depend on your political persuasion to some degree. But the re political reality is that Democrats control the House and therefore they control the impeachment process. And our latest numbers show that more than 200 Democrats in the House now say that they are open to impeachment. So they're getting very close to that magical 218 number that would enable them to pass any articles of impeachment that were to come before the House of Representatives. Kim, I want to ask you a question. Um, the, uh, you know, we've been hearing a lot about impeachment, if it's not an inquiry or articles or whatever. The conversation has come up a lot uh, in the news. And I'm wondering, you know, some have said that this may be a risk if the Democrats cannot eventually get to the point where they're impeaching the president, right? That it's, people will be, become exhausted with this conversation that kind of feels to go nowhere. But I want to ask Kim Whaley, is there value in the process of moving forward, value for the American people, even if it doesn't result in an impeachment? Absolutely no question. I mean, so impeachment is just the actual indictment, so to speak, in the House of Representatives. It's the list of potential reasons to remove a president. And then that list goes to the Senate, and the Senate would actually hold a trial presided over by the Chief Justice of the United States. But historically, there's never been removal at the, at the Senate level. But we have seen, you know, President Nixon feel pressured to resign um, as a result of that. So it can have effects, even if there's not an ultimate impeachment. But the bigger issue is, if we if we cannot hold a president accountable for wrongdoing in the courts because of the DOJ memo banning prosecution of a president, it has to be in the Congress. And I hear Lindsey Graham talking about Joe Biden, talking about the whistleblower. Those are distractions. The issue is the office of the presidency, is the person in that office. That person's conduct and whether that person's conduct warrants politically a different person in office. We're not talking about putting someone in jail, we're talking about, is this the kind of person that's safe to lead this country for a number of reasons? And also, without any sort of speed limits and tickets on the office of the presidency, um, if this kind of behavior, regardless of whether there's a quid pro quo, that's another distraction. That's not required um, to, to justify impeachment. Maybe that gets the president off the hook based on these five pages of extortion, which would be even more serious. But if we don't have limits on the office of the presidency, we are creating an unlimited presidency that looks more like a monarchy, and people without any limits on their power tend to abuse it, whether it's this president or the next president. That's the question, and it's really unfortunate that our elected members can't keep their eye on the ball and understand the process itself has value, even if he stays in office. All right, so it is the top of the hour here. So we want to say hi, everyone. I'm Anne Marie Green alongside Vladimir Dutier. We are continuing to follow the response after the White House released a transcript of President Trump's July phone call with Ukraine's leader. In that call, the president asked for an investigation into former Vice President Joe Biden and suggests a meeting with his lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, 
should happen. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about President Trump's personal attorney, Mr. Trump's personal attorney. The document is not verbatim. It's an interpretation of the call by a White House aide. And it's not slowing down Democrats at all who just yesterday convened an official impeachment inquiry. This is all based around a whistleblower complaint. That complaint has not yet been made public. The president, as you can imagine, is calling this a witch hunt. All right. So for more on this, let's bring in CBS News intelligence and national security reporter Olivia Gazas. Alongside her is CBS News political correspondent Ed O'Keefe. CBS News legal analyst Kim Whaley joins us from our Washington bureau. And our CBS News chief congressional correspondent Nancy Cordes is on Capitol Hill. Uh, so first, Nancy, let's begin with you. Uh, the question that we've been posing all morning long is sort of what is next? for Democrats. I know that tomorrow is going to be a big day on Capitol Hill with all the testimony that is expected to happen. What are you hearing about the potential, the possibility of having this whistleblower come forward? They are scrambling. They're still hoping that the whistleblower will be able to come and testify behind closed doors with the House Intelligence Committee tomorrow. But that is contingent on striking some kind of agreement with the director of national intelligence that the whistleblower will be legally protected if he or she does so. Uh, the House Intelligence Chairman Adam Schiff told me this morning that the whistleblower is eager to talk uh, both to the House and Senate Intelligence Committees and time is really of the uh, of the essence here for those committees because Congress is set to take a two-week break starting on Friday. And so Democrats would very much like to get this interview done before they leave, uh, before the momentum slows. Uh, beyond that, what Pelosi laid out uh, in her announcement that she was now embracing a formal impeachment inquiry was the fact that the six congressional committees that have been investigating various uh, potential acts of wrong or wrongdoing, uh, they will continue on those paths. There will not be a separate committee established to look at the Ukraine controversy or, or any other potential impeachable offense. The determination was made that these committees are already pretty far down the road and that you'd only be uh, slowing the process down if you were to create an entirely new Watergate-style select committee. So those committees will continue to investigate. And uh, as Pelosi put it, she wants them to work expeditiously. Many Democrats tell us they do not want this process to drag on for a year and enable Republicans to argue that the only thing that Democrats care about in an election year is impeachment. They want to move quickly, expeditiously, as Nancy Pelosi put it more than once. So the House Judiciary Committee will run point at the end of the day, will decide whether to uh, initiate charges against this president, uh, whether to vote on articles of impeachment, and once they do so in the committee, then those articles of impeachment would be brought to the full House of Representatives. What happens after that is an even bigger question mark, because as you know, as of right now, there are no Republican senators and Republicans control the Senate who are on board with the notion of impeachment right now. So, Olivia, for, and we're gonna, for the people who are just tuning in, Let's just go back to this five-page document, which is being called a transcript of the uh, conversation that the president had with uh, the president of Ukraine. It's not word for word. It's, it's not, not verbatim. Right. It's, it's not verbatim. It's not like, you know, people might see uh, on TV, you get the closed caption it's, as it's happening. That's not what this is. But I want to ask you the biggest things that jumped out when you went through this. It's interesting because it's already being discussed as a sort of eye of the beholder Rorschach test mm -hmm. on whether you believe the president is conducting himself appropriately or whether the, his conduct merits uh, an impeachment inquiry. I mean, just looking at the words, I think it is striking to me, even though you might not be able to put your finger on a quid pro quo, you know, the president has said, asks, you know, the, 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 the president of Ukraine saying, you know, whatever you can do, it's very important that you do it if that's possible. The president of Ukraine, you know, responds. I guarantee that as president of Ukraine, that all the investigations will be done openly and candid, candidly. You know, again, the president says, you know, if you can look into it, that sounds horrible to me. I'm sure you will figure it all out. You know, it's not saying, you know, I will give you X if you do Y, mm -hmm. but it, there's, there's clearly a, a, a very, um, there's, there's, an, there's a level of pressure there that I think is not is beyond dispute. Yeah, when you read it, you know, the president said, listen, he said two things. He said, listen, I was concerned about corruption. And he also said I was concerned about other European countries paying their fair share. And he does mention that. But he mentions that once each, those two things once each. But he keeps coming back around 
to Biden and investigating Biden. And please talk to Rudy Giuliani and the AG. And the question, of course, becomes uh, the president's interest all of a sudden in corruption and why specifically Ukraine. There are a lot of countries that the United States deals with uh, that are corrupt. And the president doesn't seem to have a problem dealing with Kim Jong-un. He doesn't seem to have a problem dealing with Vladimir Putin. He doesn't seem to have a problem dealing with a lot of unsavory people, Mohammed bin Salman, uh, who is accused by our intelligence agencies of having murdered a journalist. Um, and yet here, in this particular case, he's very concerned about corruption and specifically how it relates to his political rival, Ed. And so I guess for Democrats uh, on Capitol Hill, that is what they're looking at. Republicans, on the other hand, seem to be going by the letter of the law, whether there was a quid pro quo. Well, the president, based on this transcript, didn't ask and for something in exchange for something else. And as we've been pointing out, it's going to depend on how you read it. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's going to depend on who this whistleblower is, how the House and Senate Intelligence Committee get to talk to that person, if at all. Um, and, and, you know, and just how Democrats in general handle these allegations in the next few weeks. I've been pressing people. I know Nancy has, too. How quickly could this happen? When will it happen? You have a two-week recess that starts at the end of the week, primarily because of the upcoming Jewish holidays, that they're, they're trying to account for that. Um, one aide I talked to last night said this is a great opportunity for members to go home and explain the gravity of the situation to constituents and build support in their districts for this and build awareness of it. Uh, but I said, D doesn't this also potentially leave open the opportunity for this to just sort of fester and go away and for people to forget about it? And he said, sure. But this time, given how many Democrats now are on board with this, they're going to have to go home and talk about this, explain it, defend it, and, and see if, uh, if support builds up. But, um, you know, it, it's telling. And we, we also know, remember now, that the president and the speaker spoke yesterday, that he seemed to be trying to ward this off, and that they were somewhat shocked, the president was, that she did what she did last night by saying, we're not going to do this. Um, it's been released. Uh, this, this shows you how quickly all of this has transpired and how grave many lawmakers thought it was and how grave potentially the White House thought it was, that they thought they should just put it out there and allow people to interpret it. Which is but what you're hearing the president and his supporters now do is say, okay, here's all the information from the president on Ukraine. Now let's go ask Joe Biden what he and his son were up to in Ukraine. This morning, the head of the Republican National Committee saying perhaps Vice President Biden should release the transcripts of all his conversations with the Ukrainian leaders when he was vice president. I'm just going to pipe up to say that, again, that the call is just one part of the whistleblower right. complaint. We understand that there, there may be more, uh, which is why I think it becomes essential for the whistleblower, him or herself, uh, to be made available to the committees and to sort of give more of the story as to what else might have been happening that was of concern. We've got uh, Nancy Cordes and Kim Whaley uh, in D.C. Nancy, oh, over to you before you run. Uh, what are you hearing? I mean, we, we just heard from Lindsey Graham. We heard uh, from Chuck Schumer. But I'm curious uh, what some Senate Republicans are saying or perhaps not saying. I know that Lindsey Graham yesterday seemed to distance uh, himself from all of what was happening uh, on the Hill. Right. Well, I'm just looking at my uh, phone for a second because our producer, Alan, he was able to catch up with Mitt Romney, uh, the senator from Utah. As you know, he is one of the Republicans who has been most critical of the president. But at the same time, he said last night that he felt that perhaps Nancy Pelosi had gotten a little out over her skis on the impeachment front. Well, he was saying something different today after reading that transcript. And let me tell you what he said. He said, I did read the transcript. It remains troubling in the extreme. It's deeply troubling. Uh, he says there's a process in the ha that the House is pursuing. The Senate is also looking at the testimony of the whistleblower. So there is an evaluation of gathering more facts. And this is along the lines of what you are hearing from many Democrats as well. They say, clear away all the noise, clear away all the politics. What you see in this summary of the phone call is exactly what they expected to see. The president pressuring the leader of a foreign nation to gather dirt about the president's political opponent. The president is not telling the president of Ukraine to crack down on corruption in his country more broadly, as the president initially claimed. The president of the United States is solely asking him to dig up dirt on a political opponent, to investigate his potential 2020 rival. And Democrats say you don't need to know any more than that. You know, Kim, um, I'm, 
I'm reminded of the smoking gun tape uh, during the Watergate crisis, uh, where leading up to that moment, there was investigation after investigation. And on Capitol Hill, they were struggling with what to do. And all of a sudden, the smoking gun tape comes out where Nixon is in the Oval Office with uh, Handelman. And Nixon barely acknowledges a comment that uh, Handelman makes about obstruction and, and possible conspiracy. I think he grunts a response. And that was enough for the threat of impeachment uh, back in 1972. Here, you have this uh, document, and we don't even have the full story yet because we don't have the whistleblower, but the process and the separation of the three co-equal branches of government is, I think, at the heart of what we're talking about here. The president's ability to conduct uh, the, uh, the, the, his responsibility as the president, for sure, and conduct national security conversations with foreign leaders, for sure. But what he's asking in the conversation um, is really what the Congress is looking at as far as their oversight over the executive branch. Yeah, and there's a bit of a, I think, a smoke and mirrors in making this about, the, Lindsey Graham making this about the president's ability to have confidential communications with foreign leaders. Uh, the Congress did not ask for the for the actual transcript here, unlike in Watergate, where the Congress actually had to fight all the way to the United States Supreme Court to get the tapes. And as you suggested, once the tapes became uh, clear, uh, uh, came, came to light, then it was a house of cards. Things quickly fell against Nixon politically. But here we basically have we have the what the whistleblower complaint we still don't have it. It was supposed to be turned over 7 days. As I said, I don't think that the 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 analysis in the DOJ memo is particularly solid. I, they they can make that call and they did make that call. Um, but but in this moment that the issue is we still don't have that. What we have is what the White House decided to make an issue out of by putting it out as a as the transcript when no one asked for that. And it's true that that is the core of executive power. That's in Article 2. But that's not really at stake here. I, I disagree with Lindsey Graham in suggesting that's what, it, what, the, what this is about. That's shifting the narrative. What this is about is accountability for the office of the presidency, the office of the presidency. If the, these kinds of things go unchecked, um, which I think uh, Olivia did a great job w walking through why there are some real concerns in this transcript, if these things go unchecked, what we will get as the American populace is an unchecked office of the presidency. It's precisely what the framers of the Constitution and the revolutionaries fought and died to prevent. They did not want a King George anymore, bullying them and having unlimited power. That's what this is about, um, not about whether the whistleblower had a bias or or this piece of you know detail, that piece of detail. It's the overall picture that I think we all need to really keep our eye mm. on in this moment. So you don't care, Kim, if, if, if uh, as the uh, as some Republicans are pointing out, that the uh, discussions that Vice President Biden had with Ukrainian officials come out because of the fact that they were forced to release um, this so-called transcript. You, you that doesn't that doesn't matter to you as far as the office of the presidency and the way the president is conducting himself. Well, I'm not sure I would make that leap because again, the White House decided to make an issue out of the transcripts. They said we won't release the transcripts. There was never a request for the transcripts. There was a request for the whistleblower complaint. Um, and so to the extent to which there's something waived as far as the White House's prerogative to have this kind of, uh, these kinds of transcripts confidential, that's on the White House. That was their unilateral decision to do that. That's not to say the Congress at some point would not have asked for it. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean, because the White House did this unilaterally, that the Obama administration, you know, it has to, has to follow suit or the the determination should be made with that, with respect to the Obama administration. But I think the thing to keep in mind with respect to um, Mr. Biden, we don't know the details, but but it sounds like that was a foreign policy diplomatic discussion. Um, it was for a policy prerogative on behalf of the United States. It was not, hey, do something for my son. We, we don't have anything even remotely um, looking like that. And of course, Joe Biden's not president. Uh, if he is president and he does stuff like this, he should be under the same kind of scrutiny. Because again, it's about the office, not the man or the woman. Um, I want to head back to uh, Nancy Cordes. Nancy, uh, Adam Schiff just tweeted. And um, what he tweeted was something that we've heard the, uh, the pre president's critics uh, suggest about him before and the way that he speaks. 
Right. Um, and this is the, the chair of the House Intelligence Committee. So uh, the fact that uh, this is the person who's tweeting this comment makes it even more significant. Here's what he says after reading the transcript or uh, really a summary of the call between the president and the president of Ukraine. He says the transcript of the call reads like a classic mob shakedown. We do a lot for Ukraine. There's not much reciprocity. I have a favor to ask. Investigate my opponent. My people will be in touch. Nice country you got there. Would be a shame if something happened to her. So the point that he's making, colorfully, is that uh, you don't need to have an explicit quid pro quo. Yeah, you don't need to have the president saying, I won't give you your military aid unless you do this for me. Uh, what Schiff is saying and what many, when many Democrats have also argued is that the threat was implicit because the president, one week before this phone call, one week before his first phone call with the president of Ukraine ever, had suddenly, mysteriously, unexpectedly decided to withhold $400 million in military aid, and that fact was hanging over the entire phone call. But still, you know, what he's asking voters to do is read between the lines and go along with him on this ride. And uh, part of the sort of political calculation for Democrats is whether or not people are going to want to go along for this ride without some clear-cut proof, Nancy. Correct. And what Republicans are arguing uh, is that this is going to be very politically damaging for Democrats in the same way that impeaching Bill Clinton was damaging back in the late 1990s for Republicans uh, because voters will feel sorry for the president. Voters will view the opposition party as having overreached. What Democrats argue, and they're certainly hoping that they're right, it's hard to prove uh, anything ahead of time, but what, they're, what they believe is the case is that this is is very different from Bill Clinton in the 1990s. First of all, this is a matter of national security, they argue. Uh, that impeachment case was decidedly not. At the heart of that impeachment case was an affair and perjury. Um, furthermore, they argue that President Clinton was a lot more popular back in the late 90s with approval ratings in the 50s, 60s, even 70s at some points than President Trump is now. His approval ratings are quite a bit lower, and they they believe that will continue. They believe he has a ceiling of support that he has never been able to get beyond, and they think uh, that is going to be the case now. But that is the reason, and Ed mentioned this a short time ago, uh, that that very tension is the reason that so many of Demo so many Democrats believe that it would be better to complete these, this process sooner rather than later. They don't want to drag it out, even if there's a possibility that they could get more documentation, more evidence, if they waited and worked and went through the courts. They want to get this done and get it over with because they fear that the longer this drags on, the easier it is for Republicans to argue that the only thing that Democrats care about is impeachment. And Nancy, isn't there a debate now about why not just proceed on impeachment on this specific matter and not sure. on all the other ones? Sure. In fact, I had a Democrat argue to me yesterday that they could uh, bring articles of impeachment before the House by the end of the week if wow. they really wanted to. That's how badly yeah. some Democrats, particularly Democrats from swing districts, would like to do this and get it behind them. Uh, th you know, what, what they really fear is sending a message to independent and Republican voters in their districts, the kind of voters they need to win over a sliver of those voters in order to get reelected. They don't want to send a message that rather than working on behalf of, of their district or their state, what they're really focused on is trying to find various ways to punish the president. They say, look, even if we impeach him for obstruction of justice because we're not getting our hands on the documents that we want, fine, let's do it and let's move on. And we can put it another way that maybe people understand. This one's a lot easier to digest because we got tapes and we're in the process of getting the receipts. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. And you know, and all the other ones, emoluments. Uh, wrongdoing by the family, election interference in 2016, mm -hmm. harder, to harder, explain. To yeah, harder to explain. The to Mueller people. report didn't deliver what Democrats thought it might. Right. This one's easier, which is why you've seen so many of them uh, suggest that why don't you just proceed on this one article. So let's play uh, the president's reaction uh, to the release of this so-called transcript, this memorandum. Uh, he was speaking uh, at the United Nations just moments ago. Let's play that. There's no pressure whatsoever. And if you take a look at the Democrats, they went down to see the president of Ukraine 
and they asked him for all sorts of things and don't go with the Republicans and stay with us and like it's a political war. They shouldn't have done that. Uh, that should be an impeachable event, I guess, based on what you're saying. Uh, the Democrats just came out. They went down there, a group of people, some of whom I was dealing with on the gun issue, and they went down, put tremendous pressure on Ukraine. Uh, the president himself just came out with a statement saying there was absolutely no pressure put on him, and there wasn't. Uh, what I do want to see is I want to see other countries helping Ukraine also, not just us. Uh, as usual, the United States helps and nobody else is there. So I want to see other countries help. Uh, just so you understand, it's the single greatest witch hunt in American history, probably in history, but in American history. It's a disgraceful thing. Uh, the letter was a great letter meaning the letter revealing the call uh, that was done at the insistence of myself and other people that read it. It was a friendly letter. There was no pressure. The way you had that built up, that call, it was going to be the call from hell. It turned out to be a nothing call other than a lot of people said, I never knew you could be so nice. All right. So we have been. <laughs> I missed that part. Yeah. When I right. first heard it. Um, um, we've been getting uh, sort of reaction responses uh, from um, lawmakers. We have something from uh, Senator Mitt Romney. I think what's significant is that Nancy Cordes said that he was asked about this before. Yesterday, he said Nancy Pelosi got ahead of her skis. Right. Yesterday. Now this is what he's saying. I did uh, read the transcript. Uh, it remains uh, troubling in the extreme. It's deeply troubling at this stage. The process is to continue gathering information, but clearly what we've seen from the transcript itself is deeply troubling. Ed, keep listening. Keep listening. Keep listening. No, there, oh, keep well, okay, there's more to there it. More there to was that. more to it. Okay, what more to it? Because I know you've been. He essentially was asked, uh, "Well, does this mean we should uh, the, the, the House should move forward with impeachment?" He said, "No. Nancy Pelosi can figure that out. I'm not in the business of giving her advice, mm -hmm. but obviously the House and the Senate need to uh, need to." Uh, continue pursuing what they're doing in the intelligence committees, and then reiterates, but this is deeply, deeply troubling. troubling. So what do you take from that? And also the fact well, that the Senate voted unanimously to get this whistleblower document. Yeah, but that's like voting unanimously to make sure the sun comes up today. <laughs> and that's kind of what Mitch McConnell said yesterday. Look, we're going to get this. Right. The intelligence committees were already working on it. If you need us to hold this show vote, Democrats, fine, we will. Maybe it's an insurance policy because if things go one way, they'll be on the right side of history. Maybe it's a chance to say, well, look, there's not much here. Mm -hmm. You really wanted to do that? Okay, fine, but you're wasting our time. Mm -hmm. um, look, Romney saying it's deeply troubling. There's this, there's this kind of strain of thought on Capitol Hill that you ask someone like Susan Collins back in the day, Jeff Flake, Bob Corker, about something the president said, and they're going to say, well, that's really concerning. That's and deeply troubling. Deeply and then ultimately come on board with the rest of the Republicans and hold back. So Romney can say this today. Let's see where he is in a few weeks. That's the bigger test. But and it's a sign that at least some of them now publicly are willing to go out there and say, there's something wrong about what happened here. Mm -hmm. And remember, senators, given their stature, given their constitutional obligations on foreign policy and other issues like that, are going to be troubled by this. They're supposed to be. Uh, because this isn't something that the president should be doing in the minds of many lawmakers. And the fact that the whistleblower complaint is being withheld so far is another troubling issue, especially for senators, because those matters are supposed to be seen by Congress if necessary. But ultimately, if it shakes out that this isn't much ado about nothing, mm -hmm. we'll see where people like Romney. I, I by the way, we should let everyone know that if you want to read the uh, memorandum, um, so-called transcript, you got to know that it's not verbatim, but it's sort of a summary of the conversation. Of you people who, uh, who were in the meeting and who may have taken notes. Right. Yeah, that it's sort of a, a second-hand version of the conversation. And Olivia, we'll, we'll ask you a little bit more about that, but we want people to know that they can read it for themselves if they head to our website. I, so I, you have additional details to give us context, right? And and that's one of the little points that you've read about. Uh, mm -hmm. Right. So alongside the so-called transcript that was released today was this OLC opinion, the Office of Legal Counsel from the DOJ, laying out its decision making uh, as to why it didn't determine this to be in the DNI's lane and why the DNI couldn't transmit the entirety of the complaint yeah. to Congress. It essentially said it doesn't involve somebody within the intelligence community and it doesn't involve um, an, an ongoing intelligence activity. So that's its sort of legal rationale there. Um, we do have some details, again, via DOJ, about the nature of the whistleblower complaint. Uh, it's described as a hearsay account, as somebody who heard from White House officials uh, about communications the president was having with a foreign leader that um, raised concerns in this person's mind uh, uh, about uh, political prospects for 2020, et cetera. Um, we also know, of course, that the ICIG 
disagreed with the D DOJ and, and DNI. He was evalu evaluating this for himself, found it to be credible, found it to be uh, ur an urgent concern, found it to be properly in the DNI's lane. So there's just a, a, an, an impasse, a diversion of legal opinion there that's going to be rectified, I think, as more information comes out from the whistleblower, him or herself. Right. Um, okay, so uh, let's go around the horn real quickly and get everybody's final thoughts on this. And I, I'm, I'm intrigued uh, by something that Ed and Nancy were talking about earlier, which is uh, the fact that, look, at the end of the day, this has got to be sold to the American people. The American people have to come around this impeachment inquiry. And as Ed pointed out, and I apologize for the drilling that is happening as we are live on the air right now in the CBS This Morning newsroom. I apologize to our viewers. Um, that, uh, look, it's much easier to point to something like this and say the president may have asked uh, the leader of a foreign country to investigate the a former vice president, mm -hmm. his political rival, than it is, for example, to talk about emoluments or it is to talk yeah. about a whitewater land deal. If you're looking at uh, historical antecedents with Bill Clinton, mm -hmm. um, a land deal that nobody can understand what it really means. Mm -hmm. This people can understand what it really means. The question becomes, what is Congress going to do about it, especially those who are not Democrats, Republicans? That's why that Mitt Romney soundbite and kudos to our Alan He, who asked, I think, the big question, which is what everybody wants to know, what are you going to do about it beyond being troubled? Yeah. That was the question, and yeah. Alan asked Senator Romney. Yeah. So, Nancy, first to you, I guess the question becomes, your final, your final thoughts on all of this, and is it your sense that Democrats feel that this is the moment, this is the time to strike while the irons are hot, because people can very clearly understand that they may not they may still be supporters of the president, but it is not normal for the head of state of this country to ask another head of state to look into his political rival. Yes, and I think that Ed put it so well before. This is a situation that is easy for people to understand, uh, that it, and it is easy to convey why it is problematic for a U.S. president to be asking the president of any foreign country for help with his reelection bid. I mean, you heard from Mitt Romney earlier. Mitt Romney ran for president. Let's try to imagine if the shoe were on the other foot, and you had a case where President Obama, Obama, in a phone call with the president of France said, hey, can you dig up dirt on this guy, Mitt Romney, who's running against me? Uh, I think in that case, Republicans would universally find a conversation like that extremely problematic, even the Republicans who are out there defending the president now. But what's been very telling to me is the number of Republicans who actually aren't defending the president right now, uh, most notably the Senate Majority Leader, Mitch McConnell, who has shown time and time again that he will stand by this president whenever he can. Uh, it is not universal. There are times where he has scolded gently this president uh, or sought distance. In this case, he has refused to throw the president a lifeline whatsoever. Instead, he turned around and allowed that vote, calling for the whistleblower's report to be sent to Congress yesterday. Maybe symbolic, but uh, still it was a sign that he is open to further investigation by the Senate Intelligence Committee. Uh, and as he put it, the Senate is going to get to the bottom of this. Uh, so he is not excusing the president in any way. And furthermore, he's saying that he himself, uh, a top ally of the administration, was left in the dark about why the, the military aid to Ukraine was being withheld, despite his repeated questions about it to the secretaries of state and defense. And Ed, just to sort of add on to that, is it also significant that the AG's office came out very, very quickly and said, you know, the AG didn't have any conversations with the president of Ukraine. In fact, we don't know anything about this. Yeah, it is. Uh, because undoubtedly, there will be members of Congress who want to learn more about that. And Barr will have to explain himself or his potential Also someone, I mean, that many people, you know, they watched his performance in front of uh, congressional committees. And, you know, he's, he's Trump's guy. And remember, in fact, uh, Kamala Harris's team tweeted this out earlier today. Back in May, it was, she asked him, point blank, have you ever been asked by the president to investigate somebody? And remember, he kind of stumbled through that answer. Mm. He revived that on Twitter, at least today, saying, mm. well, maybe there are questions about this, Attorney General, yeah. after all. Although, as he said, in this specific case, he did not reach out to Ukrainian leaders. Mm -hmm. and, and, and to that, and, uh, well, go ahead. Well, no, I mean, just you have in black and white in this, you know, sort of loosely um, uh, uh, documented transcript 
the president himself four times saying, I'm going to connect you with the attorney general and Rudy Giuliani, four times. So what was the follow-up there? I mean, right. did, did he just stop there? Right. I mean, there are going to be questions about what the president may have even solicited the AG to do, whether that was declined. I mean, there, there's more dimension here to just, I'm going to ask him, no, I wasn't asked. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and as we need to, I think, keep pointing out, because uh, this, this so-called transcript isn't really a transcript. It's a, uh, and I'm just going to read what it says at the very bottom of it. It's not a secret. It says a, mem a memorandum of a telephone conversation is not a verbatim transcript of a discussion. The text in this document records the notes and recollections of Situation Room duty officers and NSC policy staff assigned to listen and memorialize the conversation in written form as the conversation takes place. A number of factors can affect the accuracy of the record, including poor telecommunications and variations in accent and or interpretation. Mm -hmm. um, so you can check out the full uh, memorandum on our website. Um, Kim, I guess the question that I have um, as we have been talking about all of this, and already you're starting to see some Republicans saying, well, you could see there was no quid pro quo, even though Olivia just pointed out the number of instances where the president uh, either talks about Joe Biden or talks about connecting his guy with somebody in Ukraine. Um, this is, I think, that in the time that we live in now, people want a smoking gun, but yeah. there are no smoking guns in life. There are just a series of things that happen that is left up to our leaders, the people who we've elected to uh, look out after our best interests, to connect the dots for us and to take all of what is out there in the public record and then come to a conclusion based on their investigation. And you know, when you talk about a smoking gun, I think people want to see a crime. They want to when see when you associate it with with uh, with impunity. Impeachment, right? right? But, but Kim, the truth of the matter is, not all crimes rise to the level of impeachment worthy, um, and you don't oh. need a crime in order to pursue an impeachment. Absolutely, and even crimes. Yeah, I mean, for those of us who lived through the OJ criminal trial and the bloody footprint, a lot of people thought, you know, even with something that you would think is a smoking gun, good lawyers, good good mental uh, gymnastics can can get people thinking about a, a scenario in a different way. And so the narrative is a critical element right now. Who's going to dominate it? Can the uh, Democrats hang on to the key issue, which is what did the president do, um, and have the the in additional information? The bigger picture unfold in a way that's that's thoughtful and and fair so that the American public can see what 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 happened here uh, we um, we just received a, a, a Trump campaign statement on the release of what they are calling a phone call transcript uh, and it's small so I'm going to try to read it here but because of their pure hatred for President Trump desperate Democrats and the salivating media already had determined their mission Take out the president. The fact is that the president wants to fight the corruption in Washington, where the Bidens, the Clintons, and other career politicians have abused their power for personal gain for decades. The facts prove the president did nothing wrong. This is just another hoax from Democrats and the media contributing to the landslide re-election of President Trump in 2020. That comes from Brad Parscale, the Trump 2020 campaign manager. Is a new descriptor. Uh, yes, it's yeah. a new one for for the press. Uh, <laughs> um, okay, uh, want to thank very very much uh, all of our contributors that uh, stood alongside us as we got this news, and including uh, Jeff Pegues, who first received um, an inkling of what was in this memorandum, uh, alongside our CBS News political correspondent Ed O'Keefe, CBS News legal analyst Kim Whaley, who's in our Washington bureau, uh, 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 Nancy Cordes, our chief congressional correspondent there, standing by to take us through all of this. Um, and Olivia Gazas, always great to have you here in New York. Um, it's just so great that you guys were here to help us walk through yeah. all of this. You because can see the papers spread out yeah. across spread out. the desk. There's a lot of stuff that we were going through. Yes, thank you yeah. so much, guys. We appreciate it. So for now, we're going to take a quick break, but we've got a lot of news ahead. You're streaming CBSN.
In Climate Watch, a new UN report is raising alarms over massive changes to the world's oceans due to climate change. More than 100 scientists spent the last three years looking at how the Earth's warming is impacting people and the environment. They say severe damage from rising sea levels and melting glaciers is all but inevitable. Mark Phillips joins us now with more on this from Monaco, where scientists gathered to release the report. Not a bad place to gather, just as a side <laughs> note, if you're going to get some pretty heavy information. So what did this report focus on, and how is it different from previous reports that we've seen from uh, the IPCC? This report uh, concentrated on the oceans, uh, which is, I suppose, one of the reasons uh, they held the announcement of it uh, here in Monaco, that and the fact that the, the Prince Albert wanted it to be here and spent some money for it. And it concentrated as well on what they call the, uh, the cryosphere, which is the Earth's frozen regions, the North Pole, the South Pole, and high mountain tops. And its, its main conclusions uh, were that uh, although these areas have been subject to climate change over, over uh, the decades and centuries, they've reached the point now where they can't take the change anymore and the severe consequences for humanity uh, and for the rest of the world in low-lying coastal regions and people who, who work on the sea and people who even work on the land because there will be effects on drinking water and irrigation water as well, uh, a lot of those are already in the system. How severe those consequences are will depend on how much carbon dioxide we continue to pump into the atmosphere and the report talks in terms of high uh, emission scenarios and lower emission scenarios, but basically they're 